In the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Comforter. Amen. You may be seated. So some of you may recall, uh, we had a guest preacher with us last fall, last November to be precise, a woman named Susie Harding. Some of you may recall her. She was a formal, or is a former parishioner of mine from my previous parish. And over the course of our time together as priest and par or parishioner and beyond that, we've grown to have a very close friendship. Uh, and a large part of that has been because I have been journeying with her through her ordination process. She will be ordained a vocational deacon this upcoming uh, September. So it's something very exciting to celebrate. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing to applaud. We like deacons. We love deacons, in fact. Um, but so you'll recall Susie. Um, and if you didn't, you know of her now. So when she came up to visit, because we have such a close relationship and friendship, she was really excited to see our new home, to experience the joys of it, and to see where we walk and move in the world. So uh, on the Saturday before uh, she came to preach, we took her, well, I took her to one of my favorite spots in New Jersey, the Livingston Mall. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Dominique and I, we love the Livingston Mall. It's just our speed, the food, the shopping, just everything. It's eclectic. It's beautiful. And so I'm showing Susie this. And um, as we do, when you're at the mall, you shop. So we found ourselves in Macy's buying heels together. And we get up to the cash register. And, you know, I check out first. And then I step to the side. And she comes up, and she's got the same cashier. And while she's checking out, I'm just sitting there very patiently beside her, scrolling on my Facebook. And um, as I'm scrolling, a news announcement popped up from the Episcopal Diocese of Virginia about a resolution that had passed at their diocesan convention. For those of you who don't know what diocesan convention is, it is a meeting, a gathering of the representatives of all the churches in a particular diocese or area to do ministry together and to figure out how we move forward as a ministry. And knowing that Susie's getting ordained in Virginia and I was ordained from Virginia, we pay attention when things like that come up from there. And the news announcement was that a resolution passed that moved $10 million of Virginia's endowment into reparation and reconciliation work around race. As a huge, huge deal. Most dioceses haven't done that. Even fewer secular organizations have done that. So this is a big deal. And Susie and I have been in and out. When I was in that diocese, this was something we were working on together. And since me leaving, she's continued to be a part of. So I knew she'd be excited about it. So I just turned to her real quick as she's checking out. I'm like, hey, Susie, guess what? That resolution for the $10 million towards racial reconciliation and reparations, it passed. Without a second's hesitation, both of her hands fly up and she screams, Alleluia, praise Jesus, <laughs> in the middle of Macy's. <laughs> and needless to say, everyone within about a 20 foot radius of us stopped what they were doing. They just looked over like, what is going on? And the poor cashier, she was so taken off. She, like, she literally had to like step back. But, you know, it was just... It, I point to that, there's such a joyfulness that just had to come forth from her. And that joyfulness, it disturbed everyone in that store. Everyone paid attention. There was something happened and it stopped them in their tracks. And Susie turned to the cashier and she says, I apologize if I startled you. This just happened in our diocese. And sometimes you just have to stop whatever you're doing to give thanks to God because it's that good. I share that story because it, it's the story that immediately comes to mind for me when I read this gospel passage, because we have a similar moment in it. And to, to put this into some connection, think about last week. We were talking about how Jesus doesn't come to bring peace, but disruption and fire, disturbance. 
Here we find Jesus in the synagogue. Now, remember, the synagogue at this point in time isn't just the, the home for the religious community. It is the home of the wider community as well. It's a community hub. It's, it's about like being at a mall or in church or other places. <laughs> and it, it's a public sphere. And there's this woman who has been plagued by this illness, this sickness, for 18 years. 18 years where she is hunched over. Just imagine for a moment the depth of that woman's pain physically to be hunched over. Think of the emotional and spiritual impact that that has, not being able to look up to see the sky easily, or to see in front of you with any ease, or to look in another person's face without hurting your neck. That's a painful existence for 18 years. And Jesus sees her, calls her over, and says, woman, you are healed, and lays hands on her. Jesus heals her, and the moment, the moment that healing occurs, she stands up straight, and what does she do? Praise God. I just imagine her giving an outburst like Susie did in that Macy's, and it just fills me with joy and happiness. And just like the people in Macy's were disturbed with Susie, all the people in the synagogue were disturbed, disrupted by this woman's joy. And we hear where the, the leaders of the synagogue come at that joy. They, they come at it. They're disturbed and disrupted so much from it that they don't know what to do with it. And so, they, what do they turn to? Their rules, their legalism, and they, they say, this shouldn't happen. But Jesus uplifts this woman and celebrates her healing and her joy. Today, what I hear the Spirit saying to us is less about a sermon, about a teaching, uh, or, or a moral lesson of don't do this and don't do that. I hear an invitation to embrace the joy, to embrace the blessing of God in our lives. We, we all know this, or else we wouldn't be gathered here. We, we know how challenging the world can be. We know how painful it can be, how we can suffer through it. But we also know God's healing presence. We know that hand of Jesus coming up and laying it on our head and healing us. Whether it's been healing of a physical illness or something we've been emotionally struggling with, a sense of identity, whatever it is, we all have had moments where we have been healed by the power of Christ, or else we would not be here. And when those healings happen, when the miraculous things happen, when the unexpected things happen, that joy bubbles up. There is, while our, our faith, our Christian walk can be challenging and hard at times, it is also filled with love and joy and blessing. And I feel like we miss that a lot of the time. In our wider world, particularly in this country, we don't do well with celebration. We don't do well with celebrating truly meaningful things in public. We, we are instead disrupted by it. And yet, that's exactly what Jesus invites us into not just to disrupt the world and how we live and how we change and challenge the world, but disrupt the narrative of the world through our joy, through our thanksgiving, through blessing and praising God as a constant reminder that no matter how dark and heavy this world, this life may seem, that there is someone, something much greater than us that is providing healing and transformation, that in the midst of the darkness there is also great light and hope. I hear an invitation to embrace the joy. I've had a personal experience with this recently myself. As y'all know, I went uh, to the beach in July to spend it with my dad and my sister and her family. And to be perfectly honest, going into that space, um, I had a lot of trepidation, a lot of anxiety around it. 
My father is um, living with early onset Alzheimer's, and this is probably the last large family vacation we would get to have together. And, and as every family is, mine is extremely messy and loving and wonderful, but messy and loud. <laughs> And so going into that week, I had all these ideas of what it would be. And I was fearful and I was anxious. And yet every single day on that trip, everything I thought would happen didn't happen. And the things I thought would never happen all of a sudden were happening all around me. There was so much love and healing and joy. There is a growth and a, a coming together of me and my sister. And there is space where my dad and I just found so much beautiful, loving intimacy together in a way that we've never known. And what I love to do is, it's a practice of mine whenever I'm at the beach, is in the evenings I go out to pray. I just, it's a feeding place for my soul. And so every single night I was going out onto this beach, praying and praising God and giving thanks for these miracles. And it got to the final night, and I go out again onto the beach. And it's around nine o'clock at night, and the beach is in, well, this particular beach in North Carolina is a little bit different than the ones here in the Jersey Shore. Um, there's not a lot of people out on it in the evenings. This is more of like a family, kind of smaller gathered space. So when I went out, I was literally the only one on the beach for just hundreds of feet. I couldn't see anyone. And so I had the privacy of this space. And so I go up into the water, I'm maybe about knee deep in it, and I just start singing. That's how I praise God. That's how I give my joy and give thanks is through song. And so here I am standing in the water and I am praising God. And you'll understand why I'm telling you this in a moment. My hands were in one of three positions, either here, here, or here. For most of us, I think we would identify that as signs of prayer, maybe. So here I am standing in the water singing God's praises all by myself and then about five ten minutes into it this family comes out with their flashlights and their nets and they're looking for sand crabs remember I'm the only one on this beach so much space around they didn't go any of that space they spent their entire time within 10 to 12 feet of me <laughs> And I'm just being polite. I'm like, okay, they're going to do their thing. I'm just going to continue with my thing. We'll be good. But for, you know, the first few minutes that they were out there, about five, ten minutes or so, every so often I would get a flashlight flashing up on me and it would disturb me. And I would turn around and look at them and they would just dart down and keep going back to their sand crabs. And after, like I said, five, ten minutes of this, I just talked to God. I was like, God, all right. They, they want some privacy on this. Clearly they want this space for some reason. I'm just gonna go back in, we're good. And as I'm walking back to the entrance of the beach, I notice at another entrance, a patrol car pulling up onto the beach. And I ponder, wow, that's curious. I wonder what's going on, no one's out here. Maybe they're trying to you know, check and see if people are starting fires or something like that. So I keep going into the, uh, towards the, the entrance to the beach, and as I am going towards the road, a police officer walks right past me, and within a couple seconds of him passing me, he turns around and says, excuse me, sir, were you just out in the water? I said, yeah, I was out in the water. Is the beach closed? Like, did I miss something? He's like, oh, no, no, you know, just, I, I just wanted to know, like, if you were in the water, was anyone out there with you? I was like, no, it was just me in the water, except for this one family. I was out there praying. And he was like, wait, you were what? I was praying, officer, I'm an Episcopal priest. And he was like, wait, you're a priest? I was like, yes, I'm a priest, I pray. <laughs> And, and I, I tell him the full story of being there with my family and what the experience is, and I was just out here giving thanks. And he was like, oh, well, I, I'm, you know, you, that's totally fine and whatnot, but yeah, just walk with me to the patrol car at the opening of the beach. And as we were walking, he was telling me that they had received this very odd, strange phone call about someone who seemed to be in mental, emotional distress out on the beach. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so, 
So we get to the cop car, and as he's telling me this, I'm like, oh, well, I'm so sorry that you, I, I was literally just praying. As you can see, I'm totally fine. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. It was just an odd phone call, but he never said why it was odd. And so we get to the patrol car, and he, the window's down, he's got two of his colleagues in the car, and he kind of leans over, and he's like, hey, guys, I think this is the person we had that phone call on. He says he was out there praying, and he's a priest. And they just broke out into laughter. They had this huge smile on their face, and I kind of bent down, like, hey, I'm sorry that y'all got called out for this. And like, no, 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 we're just glad no one's hurt or anything like that. But it was a very odd phone call. You see, the woman, when she called us, she wasn't making a lot of coherent sense. She was saying stuff like, oh, I, there's like a merman out here that seems to be like in distress. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not a merman. I was just praying, but as long as we're good. <laughs> And so I guess the, the moral of that story is I am an Episcopal sleesh ma or priest slash merman. So um, if you find any good fins, let me know. I'm looking for some. <laughs> But, it, it, and there's, there's a lot that could be unpacked in this story. I'm sure I'll use this image again. We could talk about how within being 10 to 12 feet, if the people were concerned, they could have asked if I was okay. We, we'll talk about that in another sermon. But the point I want to point to in this, the, the core I want us to pay attention to, is that though it started out as a private space, it became a public space in my place of prayer. And how my joy at celebrating and giving thanks to God disturbed and disrupted this family. They didn't understand it. It reminds me of how this woman in the gospel shared her joy at being healed, and yet the joy disrupted and wasn't fully understood. The same way that Susie's joy in Thanksgiving disrupted and wasn't fully understood. I hear an invitation for us to lean into joy, into blessing, and seeing it as a natural, vital part of what it means to be a Christian. Not just to proclaim God's goodness and God's justice in the hard spaces, but when God's miracles happen, when the healings happen, to proclaim with joy. And as Susie so eloquently said, sometimes God is so good, you just have to stop and give thanks no matter where you are. That is a gift that we as the church are given, that we can sing with joy that no matter what pain or whatever we're struggling with, that there is the promise and fulfilled hope that God is good, that miracles happen, that healings happen, that we are transformed and changed. And that is a gift that we can offer the world. That is a part of proclaiming our faith, our baptisms in word and example by creating space for joy, letting the world be disrupted by something amazing, something miraculous. Joy is disruptive, and it's so good. And we need it. For in the world that we've been in and continue to be in, and with all of the ups and downs, the, the news stories and the, the continuing violence in, in Ukraine and everything going on with our government, whatever it is, we look around, we can see the pain. But perhaps we're called to also reveal the joy. And perhaps we're invited to disrupt people so that they might see where the joy comes from. And that perhaps we can see and live this world a different way. So my friends, let us embrace the blessing of God. Let us embrace the joy. And as we sing today, let us sing that joy. As the prayer in um, the Compline service, a section of it goes, shield the joyous. May God shield us so that we may share our joy. May it disrupt the world, and may it transform us all. Amen.